2020. And we are so excited for today because it is the day that we get to celebrate our favorite things, which is the earth and the ocean. Um, because us as divers, we love to be in the ocean and playing into and seeing what's in the ocean and uh everything gets all you know collaborated into this one day so we love to celebrate normally four c goes out and does um dives on the boat and we do a uh, like a reef cleanup but unfortunately because of what's going on in the world um we aren't able to get out on the boats and do a reef cleanup but that'll be soon hopefully uh we'll look at doing something over the summer um, and we just wanted to reach out and say, you guys, thank you so much for supporting us during this time. Um, we've noticed a lot of you have been going on our social media, coming to our live um, Facebook Live events, and we appreciate it. So thank you so much. Um, and another thing, just to give you a heads up, we are going to be extending some of the sales that we've had last month and this month into May. So make sure that you're going to our website and we're going uh, to the shop page and you can see what those sales are gonna be. Um, it's gonna be wetsuits, it's the rec month stuff, which is reels and lights. And then next month, uh, we're gonna do spear fishing month and free diving and stuff. So if you guys are looking to stock up on some new gear to get you in the water, in this nice, beautiful water, if you haven't been paying attention, it's been flat calm out there. Uh, it's gorgeous, so it's kind of a bummer we're not out there playing in it, but. Once we can get open back up, guys, we will get you booked on a boat. We'll get you out there diving soon. So, all right. So here's how our Facebook Live works. If you could just give us a thumbs up or the little heart or the little happy face emoji to let us know you're here or just write in the comments anything you'd like to say. You can say hi to us or if you have any questions, you can write those in the comments throughout the presentation. Um, the guest presenter is going to take questions at the end of the presentation. So um, just, you know, if you don't hear us answering it right away, just stay tuned. We've got that, um, uh, that we'll have those answers for you. Uh, you also want to stay tuned throughout this whole presentation because we have a special offer code at the end, just exclusive to you guys watching live, okay? So it will be for our online store. and it expires late tonight, okay? So you wanna make sure that you stay till the end of the presentation to get that special coupon code for our online store. All right, so guys, like I said, it is Earth Day today and we wanna celebrate it. Uh, what better way than to reach out to our local uh, organizations that are here doing uh, conservation and research and they're the ones that are going out there and making sure that they're lobbying for keeping our waterways clean, our oceans healthy. So we wanted to pair with the folks from Miami Waterkeeper. And we have from Miami Waterkeeper, Colin. So Colin is gonna give yeah. you a great presentation. Uh, he's gonna talk about what the organization is up to, or actually who, who they are as the organization, what they're up to, um, some of the things they've been very successful with, some of the projects that they have going on currently and also what you can do as um, somebody here in South Florida to help keep those waterways clean and those oceans healthy. So thank you all again for joining in and we're super excited to have Miami Waterkeeper for Earth Day. Yeah, I'm excited for every Hi everyone. Uh, so thank you again uh, to Force E Dive Shop for hosting Miami Waterkeeper tonight. Um, we're really excited. Uh, Miami Waterkeeper, obviously by our name, it might seem like we are very focused, obviously, in Miami-Dade County, as well as Broward County. Um, however, um, all of these pollution issues that we will be talking about tonight um, are actually going to be related to not only here in South Florida and maybe a little bit other areas here in Florida, but other coastal communities and even um, communities up in, you know, I just saw someone's comment from Iowa. Um, and pe anywhere where people use fertilizers or uh, lawn care chemicals or anything that basically goes onto our lawns, um, this can impact your waterways as well. So keep note of different things that you can note down and maybe do um, in your own respective locations. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to say, um, as an avid diver myself, I'm sure a lot of you um, are joining us through Miami Waterkeeper, but also your Forest E-Dive Shop. And I wanna say how excited I am to get back out diving 
um, with Force E eventually um, once everything clears up here. Um, I'm on a split screen, um, so excuse me when I'm looking at one thing to control the panel here. Um, I might not be making eye contact with you, but um, that's OK. Uh, so yes, my name is Colin Schladweiler. Um, I am the outreach coordinator at Miami Waterkeeper. Um, being an avid diver, um, I'm super excited to give you this presentation about South Florida pollution issues, especially here with water quality and kind of the changes we are seeing um, to our air quality and everything around us during this time of COVID-19. Um, Miami Waterkeeper is a nonprofit dedicated to efforts to ensure uh, that our water is safe um, for swimming, drinking, um, and, and fishing. Um, if you think about those last three words, um, swimmable, drinkable, and fishable, um, any living thing can relate to at least one of these um, adjectives in South Florida, whether that be you are a regular beachgoer, um, a triathloner, dedicated commercial fisher folk, or just a local resident, depending on clean water for drinking. Um, not to mention the countless marine life that depend on healthy waterways for survival here in South Florida. Uh, Miami Waterkeeper is a member of the Waterkeeper Alliance, an international network of clean water advocates. There are actually over 300 waterkeeper organizations worldwide, um, including in places like Chile, Iraq, Sudan, Bangladesh, and China, and all across the United States on rivers and lakes we all have heard of, um, like the San Francisco Bay, um, Great Lakes, as well as um, maybe some lakes and rivers you haven't heard of, and that maybe you didn't aren't weren't aware that these are, there's these organizations dedicated to protecting them. Um, and here in Miami Dade and Broward County, as well as South Florida, we focus on these water issues alongside our 13 other Florida waterkeeper organizations um, that might be in different counties. Although we are part of a larger international alliance, we are also our own independent organization, which means that we can pick our own local issues. So we focus our clean, on clean water, habitat protection, and sea level rise. And that last one, which really impacts all of these issues we are currently working on. We have an interdisciplinary approach to taking on these focus areas. Uh, these include outreach and education, scientific research, including our water quality monitoring, um, as well as our legal advocacy. Uh, we have many outreach and education programs, um, just, three to, just two to highlight our junior ambassador program for um, high school environmental leadership, um, as well as our 1000 Eyes in the Water program, which is actually what this presentation and kind of what I will be asking from all of you today um, as an action item um, is kind of based off of, where we um, train community members um, on how to observe, document, and report pollution. Everything we do is science-based at Miami Waterkeeper. We make our policy positions based on staying current on these latest science issues. Um, we also produce our own peer-reviewed literature on the most pressing issues in our watersheds in South Florida um, and sample at our own seven locations here in Miami-Dade County, um, testing for fecal indicator bacteria, um, which is basically bacteria that can make us sick from swimming in the water. And we wanna make sure that that information is readily available um, to everyone in keeping our beachgoers safe. Uh, finally, we, I want to touch on that advocacy piece. Uh, we advocate by working with municipalities and governments, um, and when necessary, we have to pursue litigation to protect our waterways. Um, and some of these um, issues that we focus on in current campaigns are, are as follows. So reducing fertilizer runoff um, is a big one. A lot of people don't realize that um, using fertilizer on our lawns um, to make our plants grow better um, or provide them needed nutrients that are they're lacking. Um, they're saying, well, maybe if I fertilize too often or if I fertilize during the rainy summer months, um, it doesn't matter because I'm just one person. But if you think about how many gallons um, millions of people just in Miami-Dade County alone use, um, we're trying to limit the amount of fertilizer people are using on their lawns through ordinances and regulations um, to try to reduce the amount of nutrients causing um, harmful algae blooms here in Biscayne Bay in local water bodies here in South Florida. Um, and leading into that, we have protecting um, Florida's reefs, which we'll be talking about later. Um, ending sewage leaks, which has been a big problem if you've been watching local news here in Florida about um, different sewage breaks and um, leaks in Fort Lauderdale, as well as Miami-Dade County. Um, we're also gonna be touching up briefly on stopping um, FPL's Turkey Point Nuclear Power Plant, um, which has been a known polluter for hypersaline water solutions entering our aquifer for drinking water, as well as into the bay. 
um, and then water quality monitoring. So these are all campaigns that you can go to MiamiWaterkeeper.org um, to kind of understand better and kind of wrap your mind around some of the different um, moving pieces that these are all um, interacting with. Um, and I recommend you go on our um, website and look at our campaigns. And so as usual, everyone, just like we're doing this webinar that maybe isn't an Earth Day tradition, uh, Miami Waterkeeper has also um, created new digital engagement strategies for at home. So if you live in South Florida and you want to basically maybe do a quiz on knowing how um, friendly your fertilizer use um, practices are um, for our waterways, you can go on and take a quiz and it'll give you a score. Um, we also have lesson plans for teachers to use um, that are geared towards um, fertilizer use and nutrient pollution, sea level rise, um, and I think another one will be coming out shortly about coastal ecosystems specific to South Florida. Some really great resources. Um, and just some fun things to kill the time, like what sea critter are you quizzes um, that I think are fun just to do at home and share our message on Facebook and um, social media channels. I want to start our main discussion tonight by diving into looking at Florida as a whole. So, so we are surrounded by water um, through three sides, the west, south, and east. Um, water is critical to our economy, health, recreation, and environment. Uh, with the most coastline in the continental United States, our beaches here in South Florida are for more than just relaxing. They're serious business. Tourism to the state brings in $112 billion a year, and visiting a beach or waterway is the top tourism activity. Our ocean economy directly employs almost half a million people. Think about how large that is. And we all share many of the similar challenges, whether you're in Tallahassee or Tampa or Miami, which I'm sure a lot of people tuning into this webinar right now are um, listening from. That makes us vulnerable to water pollution and flooding from all these different angles and different locations. We all have very low elevation and a porous ground that is basically like a rock sponge throughout Florida. The water, that water in Florida is above ground, below ground, and pervasive everywhere. And that's impacting bays like here in Miami, Biscayne Bay and other South Florida waters like the Florida Bay. Biscayne Bay, as an example, is one of South Florida's jewels that a lot of us depend on. It's our economy, our culture, our environment. It's one of the best sailing bays and bonefish locations in the world, like a lot of other South Florida residential areas. But it's also facing collapse. Biscayne Bay and other local water bodies were chosen as one of the nine areas around the country as an area of key economic environmental concern because it's, a tipping, it's at a tipping point for algae blooms. These algae blooms are where there's too much pollution in the water that leads to an explosion of algae, much like adding miracle Grow to a kiddie pond, which is frankly what's happening when people are adding too much fertilizer during the rainy summer months of June through September here in Miami-Dade County, Broward, and almost 80 other counties around Florida that have enacted fertilizer ordinances. These algae blooms turn the water green, make it smell bad, kill fish, and it could possibly harm people and wildlife, including important habitats like seagrass that support fisheries. Now I'm going to talk about sea level rise a little bit here and how that's making this pollution problem that we're seeing in South Florida even worse and what we're doing about it here at Miami Waterkeeper to protect South Florida and its surrounding reefs. Sea level rise isn't just about flooded buildings or roads, but it's also about what's underneath the roads, where much of our critical infrastructure is housed. This evening, I'm going to share with you what's happening today, not in 2050 or 2100, which a lot of people like to talk about, but what's already occurring here in Miami-Dade County and most likely almost everywhere else that are in South Florida. Since 1996, the tide is already six inches higher. Sea level rise isn't linear, it's exponential, and that's resulted in over 320% more flooding. Today, I'm going to talk to you about sea level rise and how it's already affecting our lives in Miami here in South Florida, including the infrastructure and water pollution um, impacts that it has, including stormwater, sewage, septic tanks, beaches, power, and the effect this is all having on us. So the first one I wanna draw your attention to is stormwater. Our infrastructure is already not working properly for stormwater. Our stormwater is basically when excess water falls on the ground, but it isn't absorbed. So it's washed away through our streets and into our canal systems through drains and pipes. 
and then basically flows to the lowest point. And usually that lowest point is into a waterway. However, but what happens when the water isn't at the lowest point anymore? Water is actually coming backwards up the pipes here in South Florida and ending up in the street, a phenomenon called sunny day flooding. This is when the fl streets start to flood with actual salt water because without the input of rain. And it's because of all of this backup with um, water going back into the pipes. And that's more dirty stormwater and more flooding in our communities and our lawns and our local coastal waterways. Not to mention all the pollution from our cars and lawns that get washed away into these storm drains when it rains during this rainy summer months. Next, I want to talk about sewage. With sea level rise, the water table in that porous rock below us here in South Florida is higher and higher, and it's going up. And the sewage pipes that are actually underneath us are covered and sometimes being compromised by this water. Because these sewage pipes, especially in Miami-Dade County and Fort Lauderdale, um, they're old and cracked. Water rushes into these pipes and floods the system, causing spills and breakages. It means that we spend way more money treating water in the waste system that's not even sewage. And a lot of this time we have to fix and repair all these really broken and outdated sewage systems. This is causing bacteria contamination and nutrient pollution. This past year, a kayaker spotted a major multi-million sewage spill by observing bubbles coming up from the water. That's why we educate the public on how to spot and report pollution in our 1000 Eyes in the Water program. They are trained to look out for certain smells, certain aspects of the water, um, certain colors or things that they see in their communities that isn't quite right and that we need to be on top of. We also had a citizen report, a leak in a wastewater pipe that we found out that the county had ignored for a year here in South Florida. We got it stopped in a few days, but that was after thousands and thousands of treated sewage water was leaked into our coastal waterways. We've also been advocating for more funding to fix and upgrade these cracked pipes and overwhelmed treatment plants, which is what I hope to inspire not only here in Miami-Dade County, um, Broward County, but also other South Florida counties that are facing some of these similar um, sewage breakage issues. Definitely advocate for um, more upgraded pipes and sewage infrastructure. The next topic I wanna to talk about is septic tanks. If you aren't connected to a sewage pipe or a sewage system, you have a septic tank. Wastewater that isn't going to a sewage treatment plant is going to a septic tank in your yard or in your apartment complex to be processed in an underground storage and ultimately filters through the soil, the dry soil and into the groundwater. How many of you have septic tanks? Just think about that to yourself. Do you know that if you're even on a septic tank? And if you are on a septic tank, when was the last time you had it inspected? Do you know that it's actually appropriate to get it inspected every two to three years and that's the recommendation? Similarly, septic tanks are impacted by sea level rise because the water table is increasing and it's getting so high, there isn't enough dry ground actually between the septic tank itself and the water table below it to properly sanitize the waste. The county here in Miami-Dade recently published a report that of the 100,000 septic tanks in this county alone, over half are not working properly part of the year due to sea level rise. They're already compromised. This is not an issue that might happen. We already have almost 60,000 septic tanks that are compromised by the increasing water table. We've been supporting municipalities across the region to convert septic to sewer. And this is something I advocate for all of our South Florida counties and residents to try to advocate for, um, getting off septic and sewer if you can, and persuading your local um, municipalities to do so. Next on our list is one of our main campaigns, I'm headed up by our advocacy department, is our Turkey Point nuclear power plant. Our power infrastructure here in South Florida, specifically in Miami-Dade County, is at risk. The cooling canal system Turkey Point power plant uses to cool its um, water is predicted to be underwater by 2040. But licenses were just granted to extend this power plant's use until 2052. And this would make it the oldest nuclear reactor in the world, essentially a science experiment in our backyard right here in South Florida. Florida Power and Electric has already admitted that there is contaminated hypersaline water leaking into Biscayne Bay and our drinking water supply in our aquifer. That's why here at Miami Waterkeeper, we're challenging the license before the NRC and now in Washington DC Circuit Court 
to try to stop their renewal of this license. The last thing I want to mention here on this graph is about fertilizer. All these pollution inputs are causing the algae blooms that I mentioned um, earlier in Killing Biscayne Bay, but also all different kinds of different water bodies across South Florida. I know of very, very specific ones in Stewart, um, especially Lake Okeechobee that has a lot of big algae bloom problems. Um, and these excess nutrients from fertilizer, specifically nitrogen and phosphorus, can cause algae blooms that basically shade out all of our seagrass, um, a vital ecosystem, uh, and ultimately leads to hypoxic environments or environments where oxygen is depleted, leading to fish kills. And essentially, Biscayne Bay, for example, in Miami-Dade County, has been experiencing a seagrass die-off since 2010 and has been continuing, continuing to do so. Um, because of this constant algae bloom. And it's and maybe because of fertilizer, and when we pass these fertilizer ordinances, hopefully in the future, this will limit those nutrients going into our waterways and will hopefully clear up those algae blooms. But we also have all these other contaminants from stormwater runoff, leaking sewage pipes, septic tanks, and all these other areas of pollution that we're trying to get on top of that are feeding into these algae blooms and causing different kinds of ecosystem collapses, or at least they're nearing collapse, and we need to be on top of that. Um, one of the biggest components I want to mention with the fertilizer um, regulations and ordinances I recommend for everyone to do is that um, in the summertime, we're trying to ban fertilizer application um, because during June and September here in South Florida, the ground is already so saturated with water and it rains so frequently that even if you put fertilizer on your lawn between June and September, that fertilizer isn't even able to be taken up by your plants. And it's essentially just these huge loads of nutrient getting washed into their canal systems and ultimately back into the bay, causing these really frequent algae blooms. After taking all of this into consideration, uh, I just want to drive home another clean water threat that directly relates to all of you who are divers, especially, um, or enjoy recreating on the bay and relating to our fisheries and coral, or if you just really care about our coral ecosystems here in Florida in general. Many Americans, especially here in South Florida, do not know that right here is home to one of the only, is home to the only, sorry, let me correct myself, is home to the only coral reef tract in the continental United States. As unique as the Sequoias of California or the geysers of Wyoming, and no less deserving of protection. It starts all the way up um, near Port Everglades and works its way all the way down through the Keys. And it supports a lot of different um, ecosystems here. Let me, sorry, I'm having some technical difficulties on my end. There we go. And this coral reef tract is at, is at threat during, um, because of two specific projects. One in the past was called Port Miami dredging. Dredging is the act of removing silt uh, and other material at the bottom of the ocean um, and bodies of water. And by removing this material and widening and deepening these canal systems, um, we are able here in the United States to accommodate the next generation of larger container ships that have been being built and larger cruise ships. And when we do, when we move this fine silt, uh, it, all this material gets dislodged around the area of the dredging site and ends up smothering and surrounding the ecosystems, choking out wildlife, and more importantly, burying our fragile coral ecosystems. In 2013, the Army Corps of Engineers started their dredging project. This was to expand Port Miami to be wider and deeper, and essentially they hired a team of um, environmental surveyors to go in and see what the damage that could be done and was done. The evidence is clear that the dredging operation, which began in November 2013, deposited an asphyxiating blanket of sediment atop our coral reef, the same reefs that protect South Florida's imperiled coastline not to mention all the protection that we get from these coral reefs, like storm surge protection. They support our teeming fish populations and help sustain our booming tourist industry. These coral reefs and seabeds were covered to the extent of 250 acres or 250 football fields of seafloor. The immediate impact site was within 0.5 kilometer or half a kilometer of the dredging operation, but from our estimates, it could have reached up to 25 kilometers away. Coral cover in the Florida reef track has declined by at least 70% since 
since the 1970s. Staghorn corals specifically, which were once common in shallow water, especially here in South Florida, have declined an estimated 98% and are now threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. The affected areas adjacent to the dredge site are of high conservation value and have been designated as critical habitat for the recovery of these threatened staghorn corals. But however, we did file litigation against Port Miami in 2014. Uh, we were able to secure restoration of some kind of, of some coral species in that area. Um, but now I want to bring to attention that we're almost repeating the same mistakes in Port Everglades, which is between Miami and North, almost by Boca. We have filed a lawsuit against the Army Corps of Engineers for Port Everglades and have put it on hold pending the Corps' agreement to redo environmental impact surveys. This will hopefully prevent another dreadful disaster where they went in and were not familiar with how much corals they were actually impacting. Local residents taking action to support organizations and help speak up for coral conservation are going to be who ultimately help save our coral reefs and win this. As fellow divers in South Florida citizens, we need to step up to help defend the ecosystems around us we depend on before they are buried and out of sight. Look out for our local calls to action regarding Port Everglades and make sure to sign our petition page under Protect Florida Reefs on our website. A simple way you can help advocate for these threatened corals is by signing your name and your support, as well as speaking up when you hear about it in local um, conversations in your own counties and municipalities. And I just want to take a little bit of time to start talking about the current water quality status. Um, a lot of people who have been watching the news and different media outlets recently have been discussing how COVID-19 and the lack of swimming and the lack of boat traffic have had um, better or better um, and positive impacts on our ecosystems. Um, and during this time, uh, the last month, we have seen very little boat traffic in our offshore waters. We've seen very few people to know people at the beaches um, and that could lead to the reason why some of our waters are clearer and bluer but we also want to note that there's very little rainfall as well recently and without this rainfall as you saw in our graphic earlier this may be a big reason for increased water clarity due to the decrease in runoff and stormwater related pollutants that we're seeing and so the no rain and boat and boat traffic is helping um, ease up the water quality and make it cleaner and clearer. Um, but also with all of this, we've also been seeing some exciting um, sightings of protected wildlife, which is why we launched our Sea of Fish, Send a Fish campaign. So these two bottom images I wanted to show on your screen now. Um, the one on the left is of two very rare endangered um, small two sawfish that were um, recorded and sent to us by one of our local residents here in South Florida. Um, this is maybe, if you're not familiar with the small tooth sawfish, this is a very exciting observance of these two species, um, or these two individual species, uh, individuals, um, mainly for the fact that this is the first time that two small tooth sawfish have been seen together in Biscayne Bay. Um, and we, as soon as we got this video, we in, instantly jumped on it and sent it to our partners over at NOAA and other um, environmental agencies that are spending years and years researching these animals and trying to understand their behaviors, trying to understand their um, migration patterns and where they hang out and where their habitat really is. Because the more evidence we have to support this, for example, where this man may have um, cited these two traveling together, an already very rare site, this could mean that could possibly be a breeding ground for these small two sawfish, which means we could gain protection for those animals in that area which essentially that one photo and video that this resident sent to us was able to start a conservation plan for those animals and possibly further questions. Um, and so we started this campaign, see a fish, send a fish to send it to us on our social media platforms, as well as our email, um, just to, so we can see how all of a sudden with all this boat traffic gone, people gone, the water clearing up because of lack of rain, we're seeing all these animals that maybe are initially shy, like the small tooth sawfish, or animals that don't usually come inwards because of noise pollution. Um, they're now coming and being seen here. Um, so 
even though we're not really quite sure if the water is getting clearer and better um, here in Miami-Dade County, but we are seeing animals more frequently come out and maybe it's just because we're more aware of it. But also on Earth Day like today, I think it's really important to make that connection with people. Even if now all they're doing is sitting at home, looking out their apartment windows and they notice a manta ray or a pod of dolphins, um, it's making a connection that they didn't have before in their busy day-to-day -day lives and not um, being at home. Um, so I'd just like to ask everyone, especially in the South Florida area for Miami-Dade and Broward counties, um, that when you're looking out your windows and walking on your communities, if you see a fish, send a fish. Um, and we want to observe and document, and hopefully this could maybe be compiled into different uh, management plans for these species. And I also just added this slide today, uh, this picture I wanted to show everyone, um, of kind of what waterkeeper organizations strive to do. So this picture was a report that we actually received last night um, from one of our local residents. They sent it to us um, in Aventura uh, in Miami-Dade County and said, um, I am seeing from my apartment window, I looked out and we see an oil sheen. If you look really closely at the photo, you can see some kind of rainbow sheen on the water that's encompassing almost the entire canal way. Um, and this is important because we train and let people know to observe their surroundings and report pollution to us. And during this time of COVID-19 and when we're all trying to get out and maybe walk around our communities, spending more time in our neighborhoods, maybe we live on a waterway. When you're looking at your water, make sure you're just looking for things that maybe you didn't see before, like odd colors or plumes that are being discharged into your waterways and your rivers and your coastal waterways, um, maybe some weird smells um, and also algae blooms and excess marine debris, like derelict fishing gear and traps that you may see under the water. Um, and now that the water's clearer and cleaner, we can maybe see some of those pollution issues because Miami Waterkeeper, along with our other Florida waterkeepers, are still fighting to ensure that our pollution issues are resolved. We're still fighting. Um, I've been um, dealing with this um, spill for the last 24 hours, trying to understand what the contaminant is and regulating with the Coast Guard, as well as other local authorities to get it figured out and ensure that it's resolved. Um, so not only if you see a fish, send a fish campaign, but also if you see pollution, definitely report it to us and it timing matters. So if you see something like, oh, it's so big, that oil spill or that chemical spill that I'm seeing from my apartment, someone has to know about it. Why would I report it? But the local authorities, if you report that now to us and then we're able to talk to them, they maybe didn't know that it had moved that far up the stream and they might be still searching for it. So you might have just found its current location and that helps us with our um, ensuring that it gets resolved faster. So as I share with you earlier, um, I'm gonna wrap it up now that these issues um, um, that I went over, that they all impact our lives no matter who we are, how we use our water um, resources. Um, and I hope you learned a little bit about some of our key focus areas at Miami Waterkeeper. Um, and now you understand just how connected these focus areas are and why our interdis interdisciplinary approach is needed to tackle it from um, legal advocacy, research, and outreach and education. And it all begins with our local residents taking action and observing our waterways. Miami Waterkeeper is just seven um, local scientists and educators, and we can't have our eyes on the bay at all times. And so if we have all of you looking out for us, looking out for wildlife, looking out for pollution, and reporting it to us on any of our social platforms, our website or our email at the bottom of the screen, um, we'll be able to stay on top of the pollution issue even during this time of COVID-19. Um, and I've shared a quick snapshot of our pollution issues earlier um, and how they're magnified by sea level rise. And I hope we have some questions now and I wanna thank everyone um, for this presentation and happy Earth Day. And then Nicole, whenever you're you like Colin, can you hear me now yes all right thank you colin that was awesome uh we got a lot of folks here and we've got some questions coming in um just give it a second here to type uh just wanted to give you guys uh a quick reminder at the beginning of the presentation um i said i would release a uh coupon code for Earth Day for today on our online store. So if you look on the comments right now, I just released it. It's Earth Day 2020 and you get 10% off on our online store. 
and this is good until midnight tonight. So if there's something that you were really looking to get and uh, you've been waiting to uh, get that extra discount, go ahead and use that coupon code and we'll get you set up and we will actually we can do two things. We can either ship it to you um, or we can do curbside pickup. So, all right. First question coming in from Jim. Hi, Jim. Um, all the sewer breaks in Fort Lauderdale, what is the cause? What is Fort Lauderdale doing about it? Yeah, so the root cause of all of these sewage breaks in Fort Lauderdale is still being investigated, um, and it could be a multitude of different reasons. Um, for example, like I said earlier, when we have all of these um, sewage pipes and things that are supposed to be outfalls into canals and our other waterways, sometimes that water, essentially when the water table goes up, it breaks into those pipes, and so not only is our pipe system trying to take in all of our sewage that we're using at home, but now all of the outdated infrastructure, it's rusting. Um, I believe the sewage infrastructure in Fort Lauderdale is similar to Miami-Dade, where it's almost over 50 years old and hasn't been replaced. So the pipes are cracking. And when the pipes are cracking, all that water from the increased sea level rise actually comes into the pipes and adds even more water. Water that we're not even using for sewage in our at-home activities. Um, and so essentially all of that water rushes to these sewage treatment plants and they can only treat so much water. And it basically ends up backlogging and adding pressure in the pipe, which then essentially bursts it in locations, um, sometimes below ground, sometimes it's other areas and it causes these big sewage breaks and leaks. And so um, it's a mix of different things with the pressure buildup, um, the crake, uh, breaking and um, old infrastructure that were built upon um, and yeah, some of the solutions to that is to advocate um, for increased um, sewage and um, sewage infrastructure budgets, basically at the county and city levels. I hope that answers your question, Jim. I think there we go. Now I'm not muted. Okay, so um, another question that came through is um, when we're talking about, you know, helping with water and like conserving water, uh, what are some of the best practices at home? I know there's a lot of people who think a dishwasher versus washing your dishes, um, you know, running baths versus running showers. What is your guys' stance on that? Yeah, so there's a lot of different organizations that are doing some awesome work that are basically tracking your water footprint, how much water you use in your dishwashers, how many, how much water you're using flushing your toilet at home, your showers. Um, but Miami Waterkeeper understands that this has already been developed. All those different quizzes and footprint calculators have already are existing online. So we like to focus on things that maybe people don't think about. Um, for example, responsible pet ownership. Um, these are all things I'm going to list off that you can do at home. So if you own a pet, uh, a dog, for example, or any other pet that goes um, to the bathroom outside, you can ensure that when it does go, you pick it up and dispose of it in the proper trash bin. Because if people just leave pet waste on the ground, that actually washes into waterways um, and back out into the bay. And that is nutrients that cause also algae blooms. And when we, when uh, researchers and um, people at UM and different um, universities have actually tested source tracking, understanding where this fecal indicator bacteria comes from, a lot of the times it does come from um, dogs and it comes from birds. So we're noticing that our waste, even if we're trying to be responsible about it, is ending up in our waterways and people need to be uh, more aware of that. Another thing at home you can do is if you wash your car, for example, um, and you probably think, oh, if I'm gonna wash my car, I'm gonna put it on the street and make sure the water's going down into one of the storm drains, but that's actually not what you're supposed to do. We recommend you actually go to a commercial car washer because all that water actually gets treated Unlike if you wash your car at home and it runs into the street, that goes right into our canal systems and detergent can actually really hurt our um, marine life. Um, so we recommend if you're gonna wash your car at home, wash it over a grassy area. So everything can percolate through the ground and can get filtered out. Another thing you can do at home is ensure that um, you only flush toilet paper down your toilet. Um, but just think to yourself, have you ever flushed down a cotton swab, floss, Q-tips, um, paper towel, anything down your toilet drain that wasn't toilet paper. That all causes buildups in sewage pipes. And essentially it causes these big thick coatings of almost like cartilage. When you're thinking about arteries and heart attacks, it causes the cartilage to build up and that causes pressure. And that also can lead to sewage breaks. 
um, because on top of all the water pressure that we're seeing um, added in Fort Lauderdale and Miami-Dade County, we're also seeing added pressure because it's getting caked on with all those different materials. Um, and you can look that up online by searching the dirty dozen in Miami-Dade County. Um, and some other things that you can do is definitely ensure um, fertilizer is a big one. Um, if you do fertilize your lawn, make sure it's phosphorus free if you're on the east southern coast. Um, so that's Miami-Dade, Broward County, um, Palm Beach County and upwards a little bit um, because our soils here are actually um, um, phosphorus rich. So we don't need to be using phosphorus at all in our fertilizers. And that actually causes a lot of algae blooms, blue-green algae blooms. Um, so when you're using fertilizer, definitely phosphorus free and also try to ban um, and not use fertilizer in the rainy summer months between June and September. And if you live in an apartment complex and you're like, oh, my landscaper does it or they do it, ask them about it and ask what their practices are and ensure that um, they're following some of these recommended um, friendly fertilizer regulations um, that we want people to be following to help the waterways. And those are just some of the ways you can get involved in, at home besides conserving your water. Okay, I've got another question. I've got um, someone talking about um, that, they're, that they live in the Southwest uh, Florida where Lake O discharges are huge news in Fort, Fort Myers and Naples triggering the blue green algae and possibly red tide. Here on the East Coast, how big of an issue are the Lake O releases during the wet season? And I don't see quite, wait, they don't see in the news quite as much here. Uh, does the different coast geography and currents prevail it from being a big issue on the East Coast? <laughs> that's a lengthy one, but. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Um, I do know that the West Coast um, specifically has a very big problem with uh, red tides. Um, where on the East Coast, we don't, we really face the blue green algae. And that could be from a, a multitude of different aspects of different fertilizer being run off from um, crops and different plantations up by Lake Okeechobee. Um, and I don't really know the geography as well. I don't really know the answer to your question about the Lake Okeechobee discharges. I'm sure some of our researchers at Miami Waterkeeper would, um, but I'm not as familiar with it. Um, so I don't really have a great answer for you about the different geography. Um, but I do know here in South Florida that we do sit, um, we do get water and things coming from Lake Okeechobee that are no longer being filtered through the Everglades, it's coming in canal systems, in pulses. So essentially, wherever it's picked up between Lake Okeechobee and but for Biscayne Bay, for example, Miami-Dade County, but also anywhere on the East Coast, that water no longer gets to be filtered through this green, basically environment, vegetation in the Everglades, and it's coming in concrete canal systems and pulses. And essentially when the water does end up coming to these Bay areas and coastal ecosystems, the water is dirtier and the water comes in not a steady flow. Um, and so I think that's what's causing a lot of this different um, algae blooms, especially blue green algae blooms here in South Florida on the East Coast. Um, I hope that answered your question a little bit. Uh, I, I'm not very skilled, but definitely reach out to our um, research coordinator, Elizabeth Kelly, um, with any questions. I can also get that from her, so I know in the future. Awesome. Okay, guys. So um, just to let you guys know that obviously we know it's Earth Day and this is why we did the presentation. Uh, there's a lot of other people doing some cool things for Earth Day. So if you get off of our feed here um, at eight o'clock, they're doing a Chasing Coral watch party, which is on Netflix. Um, I actually just put the link in the comment section if you guys want to check it out. Um, the Thousand um, Mermaid Project is actually trying to host it. So uh, they're friends of ours. Um, we, they've done a presentation with us in the past about their um, coral uh, project. And so they, uh, they're they hosting that at 8 o'clock. So if that's something you'd like to check out about um, coral reefs and what's going on with the uh, research and the conservation, it's a great uh, Netflix watch. So uh, I put the link in the comment section. Um, some other things I just want to let you guys know. Uh, it is our rec month. So right now, um, most of our presentations have been about recs. And I just released today, dun, da, 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 our last presentation on recs is going to be exploring recs with Jill Heinrich. That's right, guys. I've always wanted to get Jill to do a presentation for us, but she lives in Canada. 
So it's really hard to get her down here to South Florida. She usually only comes for DEMA and she's always busy up in Orlando. So um, I've got her doing a Facebook Live on next Tuesday. And what we're gonna do is if you make sure to sign up on that link for our, our event, uh, we're gonna do a live raffle and someone will get one of her new books signed by her and it'll be sent in the mail to you. So we're really excited about that. And um, so make sure that you register online. Um, let's see, I've got one more thing here, just came in. Uh, to, uh, sent a message to you to pass along to gardeners regarding fertilizers, say tips, say phosphorus free fertilizer three times fast. <laughs> Yes, phosphorus free fertilizer and um, no fertilizing between June and September. Those are our biggest two tips. And also, I've heard a lot about um, like weed eater or um, like Roundup trays. Like, yeah, Roundup. Um, yeah. Be sure to not spray that. There's some organic stuff that you can mix up. I'm not sure how good it is because if you looked at my yard, you would notice that we don't use products. <laughs> <laughs> we advocate for no products, products free, right? Um, yeah. I mean, if you use it, try to find some kind of um, solution that's not as harsh on your lawn and your environment. Yeah, I've got a almost four year old, so I just tell her to, you know, pick the weeds out of the lawn. Right, that's, it's a it's a chore. It's a chore. <laughs> so, all right. Well, um, again, we want to thank Colin with Miami Waterkeeper for giving us this great presentation. We've got people writing in saying how great it is, and thank you. So, Colin, I, I think you guys enjoy. Messages. And basically, we just wanted to say thank you for signing in. And guys, we're always here for the environment because we love playing in it. So hopefully we get to go back and start diving soon. And when we do, let's be a little bit more consciously aware of what our actions are doing so that we can keep these waters beautiful for future generations. So all right. Well, thank you. And Colin. Have a good night. Happy Thank you. Birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday to everyone. Have Bye, a great night. Thank you.